Today is my last Sunday before I go on holidays. So for the next three Sundays I won't be here and I'll be back on the 1st of October. But here is a little preview of where I am going. Friends took these photos when they visited the, the exact places I'm going to in a couple of weeks when I go on a pilgrimage. The, this first slide is from the holy island of Lindisfarne, which is off the northeast coast of England. And it was uh, founded in 635 AD when St Aidan uh, established a monastery there. And uh, the Christian message flourished there and uh, spread to other places from Lindisfarne. It's been a place of prayer and pilgrimage for 1,400 years. It's amazing. And then I go across to the island of Iona with a pilgrimage group. And it's a small island off the west coast of Scotland. It's quite remote. And a monastery was founded there in 563 AD by the monk Columba. And it also has been a centre of Christian mission and faith and worship and prayer for almost 1,460 years. So that's what I'm going to be doing uh, a fortnight today. I arrive on the holy island of Lindisfarne and then go across to Iona. So I'll have you with me in my heart as I worship there and think of you here and I'll share just a couple of photos with you when I get back. Well, last week David issued a challenge to us when he unpacked what it means to turn the other cheek and go the extra mile. I wonder how you went during the week with the choices that you made. He mentioned three choices that we have when we're faced with a difficult situation. We can comply and submit or we can attempt to take revenge and retaliate or we can go a creative third way that makes the oppressor decide what to do and opens up the opportunity for transformation. He reminded us that we are to have a generous spirit in seeking the best for others by creatively turning the other cheek, giving more of ourselves and going that extra mile. Last week, David also tested us with some sayings that have been said, echoing, echoing Jesus' words, you have heard it said. And because today is uh, another one in our series of living values, and the value today is love without limits, I'm going to test you with some sayings about love. You won't find any of these in the Bible, but they are part of everyday conversation and, uh, and you might have heard them in, in songs, but they're probably songs of the vintage that, that I know. So here's the first one. Love is, it's one word, love is, oh, a many splendid thing. Oh, well, you've come up with ones that I didn't even think of. I was thinking of love is blind. Have you heard that one? Love means never having to say you're sorry. I don't actually agree with that, but uh, that it was a line in a film. Love makes the world, oh, you all know that one, what the world needs now is sweet love. I won't sing it. And I just call to say, I love you. Well, these sayings are very different from the quality of love that Jesus asks of us and that he consistently and completely lived out in his early life, earthly life. What kind of love was Jesus talking about? Well, in the Sermon on the Mount that we have been going through, Matthew 5, which is the basis of the Living Values series, this is what Jesus says about love, Matthew 5, 43 to 48. You have heard the law that says, love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. 
If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you are to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. I wonder what part of that reading causes you to stop and ask, how will I do that? How will I love my enemies? Who are my enemies? And because these are words that Jesus spoke to the crowd, some of whom were his disciples and followers, how will we as a church love our enemies? And what enemies do we have as a church? Here's a story about a profound expression of love. In October 2006, a man entered an Amish school in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania in the United States and shot 10 young schoolgirls aged 6 to 13, five of whom were killed. And then he shot himself. Grief and shock engulfed the Amish community known for its non-violent, peaceful ways and lifestyle. The grief spread to the whole of the Lancaster County. But in the midst of their grief and shock over this horrific loss, the Amish community reached out in an absolutely inexplicable way with love, grace and compassion to the killer's family. He had a wife and three young children. And nine years earlier, they had lost a daughter. And his daughter's death affected him so much that he blamed God and vowed that he would take revenge one day. Some of the Amish community expressed forgiveness toward the killer. Some visited the killer's family to express their sorrow and share their pain. Some donated money to the killer's widow and their children. And then when the killer's family held a funeral for their son, a private funeral, 40 Amish people came to surround and support the family. The killer's mother said love just emanated from them. One of the survivors was a young girl who was so severely injured that she had to be tube-fed and live in a wheelchair. The killer's mother went once a week to help care for her. She said, I will never forget the devastation caused by my son, but the love, grace and compassion shown by the Amish community has been a healing balm for us. In a world where blame and retaliation are commonplace, News reporters from everywhere turned up to report on this event, asking how could they forgive such a terrible, unprovoked act of violence against innocent lives. But you see, the Amish community closely follows the teachings of Jesus. Love and compassion towards others is the theme that they have taken for their lives. Vengeance and revenge is left to God. However, some Amish people said that the decision by the community to forgive the killer and his family was not as simple as it might appear. It's not a once and done thing, said one of them. It is a lifelong process. It could be described as giving up the right to revenge and to hold grudges. One of the students who survived said, you have to fight the bitter thoughts. The students were left traumatised and some had what is known as survivor guilt. Their friends were killed and they survived. An Amish counsellor who has helped many in the community said, Tragedy changes you. You can't stay the same. Where that lands, you don't always know. But if you bring what little pieces you have left 
to God, he somehow helps you make good of it. And his name is Jonas Byler and he founded the Family Resource and Counselling Centre. I think that is a really deep, deep statement and one that we can hold ourselves. If you bring the little pieces of what is left to God, he somehow helps you make good out of it. That comment is helpful as we bring Jesus' teaching into our own context and times because it's ultimately about God. Love your enemies is ultimately about God and the strength and motivation he imparts to us to live and walk the way of love. There are no illusions about this being easy. We have seen that in previous weeks as we have worked our way through the living values that Jesus declared. They are all summed up in this one at the end of Matthew 5. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. There are several ideas to hold here that might help us understand this in a deeper way. The first is in verse 43. You have heard the law that says, love your neighbour and hate your enemy. Jesus quoted here from Leviticus 19, 18, which says, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against a fellow Israelite, but love your neighbour as yourself. I am the Lord. The second part, this is interesting because Jesus quoted this, hate your enemy doesn't actually appear anywhere in the Old Testament. It may have been assumed that to love one's neighbour, that is a member of one's own community, implies a hatred of those who were not neighbours, not of the same community, but strangers and even enemies. This talk of enemies is all too real in Australia today. We may think that the enemy lives way out there overseas. A younger friend of mine married an Iranian refugees, refugee. This, just this week, as he walked along a Melbourne street, someone so angry and full of hate yelled at him, F off, back to your own country. Now, if you're a bit shocked that I actually said that, F off, Imagine the shock to this man, back to your own country. She said that this has happened to him four times in the past couple of months. You see, fierce loyalty to one's own group or tribe can lead to fierce hatred of the outsider. And we have to watch this in our own country about holding up loyalty to only our own country. God actually requires a higher loyalty to him, above loyalty to a nation, no matter how patriotic we might be. The difficulty with hatred is that it almost always sees others as the problem, not me. We are not to live that way. It is quite clearly stated in Jesus' teaching. And then in verse 44, he says, But I say, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Could you imagine the shock to his listeners? And when Jesus says, but I say, it is with the authority that he has as the bringer of the kingdom of God and the authority of the way he lived his life. He could say, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you because that is exactly what he did. He not only talked of loving our enemies, but he endured the shame and humiliation of the cross so that we could trust how much God loved us with nails driven into his body and curses hurled at him. He could have had all the armies of heaven come and strike his oppressors. 
instead, he prayed for those persecuting him. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. And it is said that the Roman soldier, Roman centurion, and the soldiers who were responsible for the crucifixion acknowledged this man truly was the Son of God. You know, that's why Jesus died on the cross, that all people could acknowledge that he is the Son of God. I encourage you to read the front page of the circle where Matt has written about what it means to love our enemies. Thanks, Matt, for writing that. It's a challenging article that brings this text into our own framework, asking whether our enemies are ISIS and terrorists or sexual predators or those who have betrayed our love or bullies. And even within the Christian church, there have been hateful and malicious statements made on both sides of the same-sex marriage debate. The voices are so strong at times that they can drown out the voice of Jesus, love your enemies. Love those who hold a different viewpoint from you. You might not agree with them. And Jesus doesn't ask you to agree with them, but he asks you to love them. And then in verse 45, he says, in that way, if you love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. Jesus refers to a simple, natural fact that the gift of sunlight and rain as we have today in everyday life is given equally to bad and good people. The good people get no more good weather than the bad people do. God's gifts are given generously to all. And so then Jesus says even more than that, God's greatest gift was to love the world so much that he gave it his own son. In a commentary that uh, Matt has been sharing with with David and me in this series, a a, a wonderful commentary by Bruner, and uh, volume one is called The Christ Book. He says, The cross teaches us supremely that God is the greatest enemy lover of all time. You see, God loves the people that we might find difficult, that we might even be hostile to, or who are hostile to us, God loves them. doesn't mean that he agrees with the way they live or what they're doing, but he loves them. And there are several places in Scripture where this is really uh, underlined. John 3, 16 to 17, For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. God sent his son into the world not to judge you, but to save you, to rescue you, to set you free, to be able to know his love. And then in Ephesians 2.14, Paul writes, For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. Christ has broken down the walls of hostility. And that's why Jesus can say, Love your enemies. And then in 1 John 3, we know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Dear children, Let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. And we have 
um, a wonderful story, a story that is probably well known to you, that really illustrates that about showing love by our actions in the story of the Good Samaritan. And Jesus in this story brings together in the one person the concept of enemy and neighbour. After two religious people pass by the man who was beaten up by bandits and left for dead, a Samaritan stops to help. Now the man who was left beaten was a Jewish man and the Samaritan comes by. He had, uh, the man had already been passed by uh, by two Jewish just leaders. And the Samaritan comes, comes by. The Samaritans were despised by the Jewish people. They were regarded as enemies. A Samaritan stops to help. He meets the man's need by taking him to a hotel, putting him up, paying for everything and promising to return to see how he's doing and to pay the account for whatever costs were involved. So instead of answering the question that the lawyer asked Jesus to test him, who is my neighbour, Jesus turns the whole story around and asks the man who acted as a neighbour. You see, if you answer the question, who is a neighbour, it can define people into... But to ask the question, who acted as a neighbour, brings it to us that that is what Jesus requires of us. And the answer comes, the one who showed mercy. The Samaritan was regarded as an enemy, despised by the Jewish people. But he is the one who is held up by Jesus because he acted as a neighbour. And Jesus' final challenge in this story to the lawyer who asked the question was, go and do likewise. Go and be like a Samaritan. Imagine that, how subversive Jesus is. Go and be like the very people that you despise. Go and do likewise. Go and be a neighbour. Go and show mercy. Go and be a bearer of love everywhere we go. The passage finishes in verse 48 with what seems to be an impossible goal. You are to be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. So I went to various translations to find um, a different word because we struggle with that word perfect. And in some translations it uses the word uh, mature, be mature. But you can't get away from it that in actual fact the word there is perfect. Now perfection is unattainable by our own efforts. Some, uh, instead of thinking that perfection is faultless or a high standard we have to reach, and if you've ever struggled with perfectionism, you know that you continually set the bar higher. I know because I've had to deal with that in my own life. I don't do it anymore, but I used to. Think of it as having a wide-reaching mercy and love towards all, love without limits. So instead of thinking that by being perfect you have to get up here, no, you have to extend extend your mercy and love widely, love without limits, that will show that we are children of God our Father. Think of the cross. And those horizontal arms of the cross reaching out to cover all. It is Jesus' risen presence that will enable us to fully live in our God-created identity, called to be salt and light in the world, and recognising that in every person, even our enemies, there is also a God-created identity. There is a God-created identity in every... Now, their actions might hide that, but in every person there is a God-created identity. So for all of you here, you are living with a God-created identity in, and you are asked to live into it. It reminds us of Matt's earlier sermon a, a few weeks ago. I wonder if you remember it, Matt. 
about how we are totally dependent on the goodness of Jesus in us. That's the only way that we can ever have perfection in us. It's the perfection of Jesus, not ourselves. It is Jesus' love in us that can reach through us to love our enemies, to love those who are hostile. To we are to hold in balance that God loves us deeply. God forgives all our sins. But as followers of Jesus, God's claim is on the whole of our life to fulfil all his commands and living values. So never forget that God loves you deeply and he calls you into the identity he has given and he asks each one of us to fulfil his commands and living values because he loves us so much, because we are his children. In a moment, you're going to take your response cards and you're invited to just think about the message today. Think about what we've experienced through the whole of our service, through, through communion, through David's words about remembering. And just ask yourself, what might God be saying to me through this message today? What is a challenge for me to love without limits? And what is the word of hope and encouragement for me today? And when you've had time to uh, write your response, David will collect the response cards during the last song. But before we uh, go into writing our response cards, I just invite you to close your eyes and to have a moment of quietness where the Holy Spirit moves and brings into your heart the word or the words that Jesus wants you to hold today. Loving God, we, we thank you that your love for us is so great that you sent Jesus, the fullest and most perfect expression of your love. And Jesus, we fall at times, we fail at times, to truly love as you do. But we pray in this moment that your Holy Spirit will kindle that flame of love within our hearts again that allows you to love through us. Thank you, Jesus.